So will you allow residents to do drugs? And how does harm reduction or housing first work? Okay, sorry, we have to do this back and forth mic thing because only one will work at a time, so I apologize in advance. Um, so I'm gonna take this question on because this is the single biggest question we get. So here's the reality of people on the street. People on the street have a really, 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 really hard time ever getting healthy and sober while they're living on the street. So we know that. That's why housing first interventions are important. That's why these kinds of things, these programs are developed, and that's why unilaterally across the board, pretty much every homeless service program in the country has, a develop, has adopted and developed housing first models. Now, there's a difference between, a massive difference, and I wanna just be very clear here, a tectonic huge difference between come in and do drugs, and we are not gonna bar you from entry because you are a drug user. There's a huge chasm of difference between those two things. What we are not trying to do, and what we are not saying people can do, is come in and freely use drugs and leave needles on our nice new park that's gonna be IP stone ideally, and all of these things. What we are saying is that we will not say you cannot come in because you use drugs, but the second you drop your bag, we will say, okay, if you have a problem with substances, and we're gonna know this in advance, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start working with Orange County Mental Health, the healthcare agency, and every single substance abuse group under the sun to help people get free and clear and move on. Miranda has 508 or almost 600 days now of sobriety. That is because her caseworker made it a priority from day one when she got in the housing to stay as clean as she was for the 20 days before when she was in shelter. Because we know for us, for the clientele we're working with, that has to be, absolutely has to be, unequivocally, priority number one for people who are using substances, which we're not gonna lie, there will be some people that come into the program who have a history of substance abuse. The other piece of that is the mental health care. And we're not talking about that specifically with this topic, but those two overlaid problems are the first most important core and critical pieces to a person actually moving on from homelessness and moving on from all of the barriers that got them there in the first place so that they never end up homelessness again, homeless again, so that they never end up on our streets again. So will we allow drug use? That isn't the right way to frame the exact question. The question is, would we keep somebody who uses drugs on the streets and out of the program? The answer to that is no. And there's no homeless program across the county, essentially, or anywhere that would do that. So you'll turn the blind eye. Hold on, Nina, hold on. So just wait, because I, I will answer, you know I'll answer your questions. You and I talked a lot, so you know, it's gonna be okay. I do wanna let Larry answer the question and just give a little more context because Larry operates the orchard, which many of you got to go out and visit, and he has some perspective on it too. But then <coughs> Nina has to be the first follow-up. First follow-up. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much all for coming out here. And uh, David, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this and support. Just very briefly, just in terms of context. Um, I've been executive director of Mercy House for 28 years. Uh, this is the kind of thing that I've been doing for a little over 30 years. And we have a wide uh, level of experience in terms of developing and operating permanent supportive housing, much as what is being discussed uh, tonight. On an average basis, just to give you a sort of a sense of scale, we take about 1,500 people off the streets every year. Um, so when we, when we start talking about our experiences, um, it is with at least some volume, it's not just a small number. And, I, and one of the things that I want to make sure that I add, uh, that everyone knows, is that Pathways is one of our critical partners. They actually, I don't know if everybody knows this, they actually do this already. They already operate permanent supportive housing units. They're in a collaborative world with us where they're an excellent operator. Collectively, our programs, we talk about does something work or doesn't it? For, the, for all the vulnerability of the folks that we're taking in, Somewhere about around 94% of the people we take in are housed a year later, every single year. So the stability rate is actually better than what it's like on just the open market. So that's number one. I just want to set some context. And up here, uh, up here at the front of the room, there is some experience. It's not a new thing, um, and it's something that Pathways has done, can do, and will do brilliantly as time goes on. Um, second thing is, and I apologize. I'm probably going to repeat this a little bit. Um, Let's remember what we are talking about here. This is housing. This is not shelter. There's, this isn't a walk-in center of access services. 
Because all the questions we talk about, right, especially if you're a homeowner and you live in the neighborhood, is how does this impact me? How does this impact my investment of my home and the safety of my family and all the stuff that I work so hard for? And that's legitimate. I want to make that really clear. Those are rational concerns and rational questions. But I want to just emphasize what we're talking about here is an apartment complex. So as we try and figure out what, what, what can I expect? What would the behavior look like? Well, it would look very much like what an apartment complex would look like with really great management. That's what it would look like. The other thing too is just because the target population are, are vulnerable people that are living on the streets, they don't get special consideration under the law. Let's be honest, let's be clear about that. The law is the law. If there is unlawful behavior going on, either on the site or by any of the participants in the site, we'll be arrested. I mean, hit the law is the law. Let's be really clear about this. So when we, and I'll let David, because uh, he has a relationship with you, answer the question about turning a blind eye. Let me just suggest that there is no reason to cotton. There is no reason to allow illegal behavior of any sort on this site. And that has been our experience. And I am sure that will be the experience here. Finally, and I'll hand, up, I'll hand it over, and I promise not to be so long-winded with every bloody convert, uh, question. We believe that sobriety is better than addiction. Every single person sitting up here believes that. Every single person sitting up here wants to see a new life. We want to see life resurrected from the streets into an environment that is dignified. And part of that is, in fact, housing. But let me ask you, as we want members to be productive in our society, as we want good neighbors, and as we want people to overcome their addictions, from what venue is that most likely to happen? Operating out of their own home or the parks that they're currently living in? Providing housing for these folks will actually stabilize and increase sobriety in the city of Fullerton. reconcile this. A representative from Pathways was walking the neighborhood and saying that this would be a safe place for someone to shoot up. Yeah. Okay? How do you reconcile that with, well, we're not going to let anyone do anything illegal, but we're not going to kick them out if they're drug users. You're talking out of both sides of your mouth. I don't get it. Okay. I'll, I'll take it. Absolutely. Uh, Jason's Okay, so yes, that happened, 100%. I have no doubt about it because I worked with the person, obviously, and came back to my office and heard, I think I said this wrong, and I was like, yes, you did, because that's not what we're doing. And you're smiling, Ida, and it's because it sounds, I know, it sounds awful. It sounds awful. Everything Larry said about with respect to the law and what is allowed holds true. So One. you them if they use drugs? Okay, so if someone, so, if there is illegal activity, so say there are drug transactions, the truth is, and this is just being honest, right? If someone at 11 o'clock at night uses narcotics in their apartment and we're not in there to see them, blind eye. that's not a blind eye. No one is in my house seeing me do drink a beer tonight. You know what I mean? So the food alley park nope. Hold on. Let me, let, me, let me work through it. So they won't go to Adelaide Park, hopefully, because that's part of the reason we're using so much green space and building a park on our site and having big walls and things like that. What I would say is, again, illegal behavior is illegal behavior. We have a great history of work with the Fullerton Police Department. Um, we checked our call record today for our Amherst property. We had half a dozen total calls across six, six or seven addresses in the last year. We have a great relationship with the police, and we're not going to turn a blind eye to criminal behavior. What we are going to say is, again, when people come to our programming and people get enrolled, lease up and all those things to our apartments, if there's a history of substance abuse, we will be very assertive in our efforts to try to either find out what their current level of use is and try to curb that use, or to work with them towards goals of sobriety. But as Larry said, it's a choice we have as not just your community, because that would not be fair, it's a choice we have across the county to say, is sobriety best had 
trying to ask people to be sober while they're living on the street or with the opportunity to be in housing. And the other thing I would just add is, and this is something that has obviously been a point of contention, and I get it, I so get it, and I hear you, because I would think the same thing if I didn't do this work every day for the last 10 years of my life. Not every single person is going to be a substance abuser. A lot of these people have physical disabilities. We know a guy named RJ, shot in the head during a home invasion. Some of you, and some of the people here I know, know RJ. RJ lived on the riverbed because he had chronic migraines that do not stop, and he cannot work, and he will never work again a day in his life because there's no way he can maintain a job. RJ's disability qualifies him, and his chronic homelessness would qualify him for something like Keystone. The people we're talking about have a myriad of disabilities. There are people who are living who are in wheelchairs that are elderly that were living down in the riverbed. Those people would as well qualify for Keystone. So it's not strictly substance abusers. I just want to be very clear about that. That is not the single disability that is going to be there by in any way, shape, or form. So second question. communication, no cell phones, no electronics. They must look for work and clean up. After 90 days, they get visitations. The other question he said, is it co-ed? I said, yes, it is. Then you have to be concerned about people having sex and the, the potential for rapes. I really, I, I thought that was great information. He says he's seen it and witnessed it firsthand. He works for several churches in LA. He does a lot of work with the homeless down there. Uh, involves his family and his children. My other question is, you're gonna be selecting certain people that qualify. For those that I see in my neighborhood, I don't know that they're gonna qualify. So my question is, how are we gonna help those people? And then you're still gonna bring in others from other communities. And I feel like we're gonna be overwhelmed. The problem is still gonna be here. Anybody who's got drug use issues, I don't judge anybody. Are you going to provide them with biohazard containers for their needles, or are you going to let the trash people pick up trash and maybe get stuck by a dirty needle, get hepatitis C? It goes on and on and on and on. Are you going to put these people on birth control just to protect themselves from each other? I don't, under, I don't know the kind of management that you have. I haven't been able to witness it, but I know that the last meeting somebody went down to one of your churches where you had 70, excuse me, 71 people, only four of them worked. I love people, I have compassion. I just need to know that our community is gonna be safe, you're gonna take things seriously, and things are gonna get done right. <laughs> So, good questions. Um, I think the model that your friend is referring to is a shelter-oriented type of model by the sounds of it, of a faith-based group, and I mean, that's certainly not something, I mean, I think part of the thing to um, recognize about people who are experiencing homelessness in our, in our experience is that one of the most important factors in determining their success is integration into society, right? So blacking them out, keeping them from talking to their support systems, um, that could be really troubling for somebody um, who's already experienced probably a lot of trauma, like Miranda. I would hate to try to black her out from everyone, so I don't, I don't know about that model. Um, with respect to your other question about, and this is a really great question, and we've gotten a lot of this, and I, I, I'm so happy to address it because I think it's really important about where will these people come from. Right. And that was actually going to, I'm going to hand it over to Larry to talk about a little bit, but one thing I'll say is that um, Keystone's entire intent is to serve this community. So I just want to make that totally 100% clear. There's no, no one from that is homeless in Newport Beach, and yes, that exists, because I go down there and I see it, um, is going to get imported into Keystone. That will not happen, and that was something that I personally and our group that is working on this laid down originally as part of the intent of, of doing something like this in the city of Fullerton, is it would serve the residents here, not somewhere else. It works in a couple different ways. One of them is coordinated entry. Well, that, that is the singular way that people filter, filter through a system to get into this kind of housing intervention. 
Um, but the, there's a mix of two ways, and I'll just I'll speak quickly on this and then let Larry answer too and add some context to it. Um, there's two ways that can work. It can be literally people off of the street. So some of the people who you are talking about who are most troubled on the street, um, because CityNet and the PD and other folks have identified them, we can begin working with them, maybe do something where they go into temporary shelter for 20, 30 days, and we, we, we start to get to know them a little better before they lease their apartment. Or um, the alternative is actually Larry um, and Mercy House are the operators of Bridges at Kramer. Um, and some of the folks who originated in Fullerton, they could have gone to Fullerton High School. I mean, we don't know. Um, there's a whole bunch of people that are tethered to this area. Um, they might be the first to come out and get housed, but then what we would do is we would take those beds and utilize them for the people on the street here locally. So whichever way you slice it, Keystone's overall positive effect is on this area very specifically and not anywhere else. And um, that is not something I'm willing to budge on, quite frankly. And you all have my commitment that to do everything I can do to make sure Fullerton is a prioritization for this project and no other city. Hi, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, just to echo what David has said, and I'll, and I'll try and be brief, but a couple of very quick points. Um, again, as David said, what is being described is not housing. So I'm not sure um, on what program it is that sounds like a shelter, um, and that is entirely different than what is being proposed here. Uh, different regulations, different staffing structure, uh, different target population. We really are comparing apples to oranges or lemons or you know giraffes in terms of what, what you're describing. Um, again, just, and I know I, I know I said this earlier, but just to repeat, this is not shelter. This is permanent housing, and it's a very, very different thing. And we also need to remember who the target audience here. The target audience is somebody who is chronically homeless, the very people who are trying to get off the streets, the very group that you were worried about wouldn't qualify. Um, um, it is for people who have been on the streets for an extended period of time and who are disabled. And the overwhelming majority are going to have physical and mental health disabilities. That's who we're talking about. So as we talk about work programs, making people independent and so forth, it's all well and good. I, I, I believe in the dignity of work from a theological perspective. That's a thing for me. But please understand the folks uh, that, we, that are being served here are those that are disabled. Right? And that's very different than what you have just described. And then finally, and this is a little bit of a shot, and I apologize, with respect to what is being described um, with, with this other program in Los Angeles, it is not a best practice, and it's not what I would recommend for this program. It can actually re-traumatize the very people that we're trying to help. Um, um, so I, I just, I, I would just, you know, respectfully say that, um, I, as David said, I don't think we want to disconnect people from their support. We don't want to stigmatize them further um, because that does not. The study data shows that really doesn't lead to the results that we think that it will. Thank you. We only have an hour, so. I know, well, but these are your questions. Yeah, but people have follow-ups. Go ahead, Rich, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and I, I won't be on the word tethered, although, the, I mean, that's the word you use today, but we've used a variety of words about, sure. you know, serving their Fullerton population sure. first, which I think feels good. Uh, but what, what constitutes having a tie to the city? Uh, the fact that they got bused to the armory and then landed here, to us, that doesn't really like feel like a tie to the city. So can you clarify? Yeah, you all okay. cool. Sorry. I didn't... Okay, sorry. Um, so that is a good question, so I'll, I'll take it on briefly. Um, <laughs> So in the, it's okay, in the, in, in the assessment that we do called the VI Spit Out, we ask a series of questions about where did you live when you went homeless? What is your last address? Where have you spent the most time homeless? Where do you get your services regularly? So I'll give you a very quick example. And I, it's just, and, and I wanna answer everyone's questions I do, and these were the questions we got. I just, I want, we only have the room for so long, I just wanna keep it going really quickly. Um, there's a woman, she walks around downtown Florida a lot and pushes a, shop, a, a Costco shopping cart, and she, you know who she is. Yeah. Everyone knows who she is. I stopped and had a 20-minute conversation with her yesterday. She's been homeless for eight years. Um, she uh, lost her job um, right around the time of the recession or just after, and she has a mental health illness. So, I mean, the combination of the two was, was challenging for her to get into a new place. Um, she, people I know know her in this room and talk about her a lot, and that's okay. Um, she has caused some problems for businesses and things like that in the community, right? That is an ideal candidate 
or something like this because she is having a direct impact on this community. And when we ask every other city to put up or shut up on permanent supportive housing, and we will, we do it. I've had a lot of conversations with you, Rachel, about I will stand shoulder to shoulder at any city council in the 34 cities that say you need to do your part too, right? Absolutely. But that is the idea, is we help the local community with it. And that is part of the fact, and that is partially because we are divided into 34 cities and every city, as Kelsey explained last week, needs to be doing their part to end homelessness in their community. Sorry, I didn't mean to be rude, Rachel. I just... No, but you know that I've yeah, been asking all of that I didn't think was critical. And it's a good question. I, so please, thank you. thank you very much. You're going to move on to the next no next question, and then you can have questions to that question. So what we're going to do, so just to reiterate, so you, you know what's going on, is you, the community had the opportunity to send questions in of concerns that you have. So we're going to answer those questions and then have a dialogue around those questions. So as you have, you need more follow-up like we just had. That's critically and important. So... So we're gonna move on to the next question. How will you ensure that Keystone residents won't threaten the safety and security of the neighborhood? Will Keystone residents be allowed to roam the neighborhood high on drugs and off their medications? Okay, no. We're not gonna allow people to threaten you, and if we see them doing it, we will call them the cops, and we will likely start an eviction process because they'll be creating problems and breaking crime, breaking the law and causing crimes. I mean, I just wanna be really clear. We are here to be a partner in ending homelessness, and that means being the best neighbor we can possibly be. Being the best neighbor is partially putting our headquarters there so that you can knock on my door and say, Hey David, that guy, I saw him stumbling down the street, can you guys help him or get him out of here? Or hey David, I have to call the cops because this is happening. I will work with you on these and work with the police to take care of illegal activity, threatening activity, and things like that. We will have good neighbor policies that we want to develop with you. Nina, you and I have talked about it briefly once, I think, and I want to continue that conversation. We have samples of how that could work. Um, but we are going to be present and constant in the lives of all of these people and in the community. And our goal is to produce something and to have a situation that anytime you feel like there's anything going wrong with Keystone, we're right there. And not only are we right there, but we will encourage you to engage with law enforcement and to bring law enforcement over. And the difference will be, and we hear this a lot from the PD when we talk to them, if there's a call to law enforcement about a serious, negligent criminal activity, we will not just make a call and then walk away and let the police deal with it. We will be hands-on in dealing with the problem because we are the neighbors in the community now and we are going to be good neighbors. So with respect to, excuse me, safety and security of the neighborhood, um, Todd went over some of the things we're gonna do to have single points of access to try to control inflow and outflow from the, from the apartment complex. But really for us at the end of the day, more than anything, it's going to be about good neighbor policy, good monitoring of what's happening with our people, good dialogue with everybody in the community, and working really hard to make sure that that safety and security is maintained without any kind of compromise or issue. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. I want to be respectful of time and get as many questions as we can. Two quick points. Again, if there is presenting like an, a broken record, the law is the law. If somebody is breaking the law, we enforce the law. And we support law enforcement in that. Secondly, whatever uh, negative behaviors, whatever menacing behaviors that you might expect out of this population that might be living there, they're probably already doing in the city right now, if they're from the city. What you can expect by virtue of somebody living here is that those negative behaviors will greatly reduce. Why do I say that? For the following, our experience. Our experience in doing this for multiple years, serving thousands and thousands of people, number one. Number two, because now you have a direct partner, if somebody is acting foolish, to immediately engage with them. Number three, they have something to lose. Right now, they have nothing to lose. They have everything to lose once they move into Keystone. The likelihood of behavior changing is when you have something to lose, and now they would. They are incentivized to be better neighbors. Sounds like you're going to end up down the road with a whole lot full of disabled people. 
Who's going to give the support to those disabled people? Food, clothing, medications, that. <laughs> um, before next week's meeting, we're going to work the mic out. The mic thing out, I promise. Um, that is a great question. So um, we will have a staff ratio, which is undetermined as of yet, of a number of units to case managers, and those case managers will be social workers and work one-on-one -on -one with those people. Now, with respect to food and things like that, one of the first things you do with folks who come into a permanent housing situation or supportive housing situation is you make sure benefits are in order. So if you have a veteran, you make sure their VA benefits are in order. If you have someone who's disabled, you make sure their SSI and things like that are in order. You find them a medical home as quick as possible. I mean, one of the reasons the St. Jude Project has been successful, one of the reasons the city of Chicago um, has gone to this model where they've actually skipped nonprofits completely, which is, I don't really care, I just want them to help the homeless, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but they've rented apartments, supportive housing apartments, and sent in medical caseworkers directly. So because the, the value of making sure someone who's disabled has a medical home is very, very high, right? Um, so, and then we have grants that would, we would rework and re-engineer to provide even more support, especially for the elderly community. That's, um, there's no one more vulnerable on our streets than an elderly woman. Um, and so there's special needs there that we have to be attentive to. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that what the programming we're doing is very specific and helps people with disabilities for the long term because we are gonna be, they are gonna be our residents. And again, I use the example of our friend RJ or you know, there's a litany of other people. They won't work again. And the expectation that even if they could get a job in this market with given history and disability that could pay for rent on a market rate apartment isn't realistic. So we will have to support them the entire time. The programming that we will have will be engineered to do that. Um, and you know, the reality is a lot of the folks that live there are going to be in that kind of condition. Hello. I find it interesting that you didn't, you were considerate towards our children not being here to hear the story of the young lady that was in your film or in your video, yet these are exactly the people that you're about to unleash on our children and in our neighborhood. Because these people, you know, once again, I sympathize with them, but they are going, you know, it's naive to think that these people are suddenly going to stop having using drugs. It's naive to think that they will not go out and seek them, even if they have to leave your Keystone Project. And where will they seek them? Where will they seek their drugs and their alcohol? Yeah. Yeah. So I understand the need for Keystone. Absolutely, we need these programs. But do we need them within, what, a thousand feet of Village Market? Do we need them within 2,000 feet of Adelina Park? Where Nina and I used to have the most conversation lately, it's been Anita and I, and she has really good questions like that, so I, I do appreciate it. Um, we're gonna talk on the 27th about site location and why. Um, I, I will just do a quick primer of it, because I think that you're, you, you, you're owed all of it. You're owed, all owed why 1600 Commonwealth. Absolutely. The short answer before we get into more detail, because I want to provide reasons why their sites didn't work out and go into more detail and be very transparent about things, is because when we approached the city of Fullerton and we said, we have to do permanent supportive housing, we know, we know the city is going to be responsible for some permanent supportive housing somewhere, somehow. There's a, there's a plan to implement it. We don't know if that's going to get codified by a lawsuit or not, but it very well could be. We have no idea, right? We have to work with the sites where, show, where we were shown. That's it. If suddenly the city buys 66 acres of Kimberly Clark tomorrow and says, hey David, we'd rather do it there, great, show it to me. We're working with her next, okay, for sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, we are working with what we were provided. And it doesn't take us off the hook for trying. We have to try. Our job is to end homelessness for people, and we're trying to save the lives of these people. And we know and understand fears about this coming to a community. We absolutely do. We all do this work. But we have to do something. 
I said it last week, I'll say it again. I think every single person in this room is concerned about homelessness and wants to see it ended in their community for a myriad of reasons. Permanent supportive housing, as we learned from Bex, is the way to do it. The problem we have in this community is we are very short on locations to do it. And that's gonna to continue to be an issue, not just in Fullerton. I live in Orange, and I've said a million times, and I've told our city manager and our mayor, who's my neighbor, find a location in Orange and we'll do it. It can be close to my house. And I can say that with privilege because I do this work and I know the effects, and I realize it doesn't mean anything to all of you. But the reality is, we have to do something. We have to. I want, to, I want you to think about a world five years from now post-recession, which is a very good possibility, where wages have stayed flat and housing has only gotten worse. This problem will double. And so we're looking at opportunities, and that's really why 1600 came to be, is because we just said, we need an opportunity, show us something that'll work. We looked at two sites. That was the second one, and that's why we're here today. But like I said, convince the city to buy Kimberly Clark, I'll do it there. I, it doesn't matter to me. My name is Stephanie Bromley. For those of you who don't know me, some of you do, but my husband, Philip Bromley, owns a biotech company called Byron, who's also interested in purchasing the 1600 property uh, for market value. The reason that Pathways wants this property is because it's free property. It's The city is giving them the property. So I'm just wondering why you guys can't, there's plenty of private developers who are will who are willing to you know or private sellers who have property available for sale that you could buy just like Fullerton Heights went and put permanent supportive housing that's set to open 34 units over on Orange Thorpe and Commonwealth and no one disagreed they didn't impact a neighborhood um, so I'm just wondering I mean, and the city is broke the city is broke why would, I mean, everybody here, your argue, our argument, if, if you disagree with this, it, it's with the city. Yeah. Your fight isn't with pathways or, or anybody else. They have a job to do. This is, this is what David Gillanders is here to do. I, no one can get mad at him or fault him for trying to do his job. You know? Um, but if 1600 Commonwealth is zoned for manufacturing, the city, and we should all consider that. I mean, bringing jobs to the neighborhood. And no one is against helping homeless people, whether you agree with permanent supportive housing or not. You know, I just don't think that this is the proper place to do it. That's just my First of all, Stephanie, I appreciated the dialogue, and we've had a lot of it, and um, I appreciate your comments, and I also just want to tell you, and this is, I'm not, I don't, need to, I don't need to try to win over on this front, but I appreciate the conversation and the dialogue being respectful and understandable of each other's situations, because I think that, to me, is the most important part of a lot of this process, right? So, one thing I do want to say, though, is that why we are going after it is not necessarily because it's free, but because our job is to end homelessness. And I, I do think it's, it's opportunistic, sure. It's like, oh great, you have a free piece of land, like that seems like a, a tenable situation for us. Like, absolutely, like no doubt about it. But just our motivations are not to acquire property because we couldn't sell it, it's pretty useless for us anyways, to be honest. An ownership of something like this, I don't know, Todd, you can't do anything with it for like a thousand years or something, pretty much. Um, so just to be clear, and, you're, and, and I think you got to it with the rest of your point about, hey, that's my job, right? It's just to end homelessness, and I'm trying to do that as best I can. Um, so with respect to um, purchase possibility by Byron or anybody else, you know, we're aware of that, and honestly, that's a city decision. Like, I can't, I don't, I, I'm not losing any sleep over that part of it. That's not what I'm losing sleep over. And I don't mean to sound cheesy or repetitive, the only thing I lose sleep over is how in the heck do I keep people who are vulnerable and dying on the streets from dying on the streets, right? And so it's, it's there or it's somewhere else. That's my job and it's what I do. And I'm not trying to like win any trophies for it, but it's just who pathways of hope is, right? So again, 
if the city decides to sell to you guys and that's the outcome of all of this, I don't have any control over that, right? I'm just presenting them with an option to do the supportive housing that is necessary to end homelessness for people like Miranda. That's all. I, I, I think, you know, and I'll be honest, like as a site, if you think about how Orange County is built out and not up, as a site, it's bordered on th at least three sides by something that normally you would consider pretty favorable. But I'm not dumb, right? Like, I know there's no site in Orange County right now where you're going to do this, where people don't live within some distance and are not going to show up at meetings like this and say, why here? Because that's normal. I get that. At the same time, I can't not try. And so I appreciate you saying your fight's not with me. I, I, I really do because <laughs> the Facebook experience was tough. Um, but um, it was also a lot of it was fair too, you know? And um, I, I think we're just trying to get this done in a way that ends homelessness. And, and, and honestly, the fate of this is gonna sit with the city at some point. You didn't answer my question, can you guys oh. churches? Oh no, I mean, we, we, we're a $2.6 million a year agent, we, we agency. And the, you know, the money that is coming down the pike from the state to purchase and acquire properties will be managed by the county. That will take time to kind of all roll out. Is there a possibility down the line we could do something? Yeah, but you know, Fullerton has a homeless problem right now that's probably close to 300 people. And so it's hard to sit on the sidelines and not take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves and to say, hey, we want to do this, we want to partner and get this done. Um, down the road, is there a possibility we could purchase land somewhere? Sure. I mean, there's other cities talking to us about giving us parcels too or you know, some sort of deferred cost thing. So there's a lot of different opportunities. The reason I can't just walk over and make a $10 million offer on Keystone is we don't have that kind of capital. No. So there's your very straightforward answer. No, I can't buy it. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. What happens if a Keystone resident steals from a community member, or threatens, or assaults a neighbor? Can I just say one thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, people convicted of crimes will go to jail. On that note, I'm going to hand it to Larry. Yeah. And I think, given the previous answers, you can all guess exactly what I'm going to say right now. The law is the law. The only thing that I would add to this, when you have a project like this, police departments, local police departments, now have a partner. Yep. And so it makes our police enforcement more effective. This is actually a boon to community security and safety because of that very reason. But please make no mistake about it, as I know there are certain topics where I sound like a broken record, right? This is, there is no special consideration under the law. The law is the law. And if residents of Keystone violate the law, they suffer the consequences. And, and just really quick to follow up on that. So um, in, in light of the idea of moving our staff there, if we can do that, great. Um, the other thing we're gonna have is, so we're gonna stagger shifts. There'll be someone, a professional social worker of some kind or another there, a minimum of 18 hours a day, and we're holding two units for resident managers. So you'll actually have people who live on site that do all the overnight work, are monitoring what's happening, um, can be conscientious of any kind of illicit activity that would possibly happen, and they will be fully instructed to comply with law enforcement. There won't be any other ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm not going to protect somebody who threatens the neighborhood. Just not going to. I'm going to have Jason take the mic out to people. Thank you. I know that we keep saying the law is the law, and our community. Um, our immediate community did have the police department come to our park and speak with us shortly about the law and that they're having trouble with the laws and with um, drug infractions, those kind of things, because what they can do when someone has a drug infraction, if I'm not incorrect, is that they can fine them. So you will be fining your residents and how will they pay without jobs? <coughs> I'm going to apologize for so much of it being Larry and David right now. I promise everyone else will get to talk. And this is um, Judson Brown from the Santa Ana Housing Authority, too, by the way. He has a lot of experience with permits for housing. So. so again, just to repeat some things that have been said, because I think they're worth repeating. Um, yes, there it can be frustration with that, because there's only so much you can do. However, understand a couple of key things that have already been said. The individuals we're talking about are already here. They're already here. They're already in our parks. They're already in our communities. And so what we are talking about is an intervention. We're talking about an engagement. And I know I've said this a couple times already. 
that will reduce the negative behaviors. And again, while the police department, and I understand this because I've had the same conversations, right? There's only so much they can do. Because right now, those infractions are meaningless to these, or to, to a person who has nothing to lose. Again, just to reiterate, they have a lot at stake. They have housing for the rest of their lives. They have an ability to be a new person, and that can be taken away from them if they violate the law. Right now, you've got a desperate person with nothing to lose. At the very least, with the folks that are living at Keystone, you have a fighting chance because they have something to live for. But how are you enforcing it? I, that's kind of part sure. of my question. Yeah, absolutely. How do you enforce, what are the guidelines? What are the regulations? How does it work? We don't understand absolutely. how it works. How, what are the repercussions? Like I have a family, my kids have rules. Mm -hmm. I break the rules, there's a repercussion. But I don't, it would be helpful to hear something more concrete. Absolutely. So let me give you concrete because you, you're owed that and I want to be able to provide that. And so I will, I will tell you that this is a part that is not fully developed for a plan. What we have in place now is we are thinking about, um, there's different levels of severity, right? So if someone goes into the parking lot and they scream, I'm probably not going to call the police on them, realistically, okay? If someone comes over into Adelina Park and Stephanie or Nina call me and say, David, what the heck is happening? Like the police, you know, what, can you get over here and do something? I mean, in those circumstances, you are literally talking about taking, if it's a resident of Keystone, taking them aside and saying, do this again, right? Because the police probably won't throw someone in jail for screaming in a park either. But do this again, and you are starting to jeopardize your housing, maybe on a one or two strike basis. So I'm, I'm trying to be as clear as I can without saying we don't have a full plan developed, but every single person that comes in will have a program policy and contract that says you have to behave and maintain yourself in certain ways. Now, housing can't be totally contingent on small things like screaming in the parking lot, right? But when you talk about things that could seriously impact the neighborhood and the quality of life for other people, yeah, we're gonna have intervention, absolutely. And it is going to be tied to the possibility of someone having to leave. And as Larry said, you know, I, I, we hear this statement a lot, and I think the PD was here, and they talk about it a lot, how they, they talk to folks who are experiencing homelessness and they say, um, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the people don't accept services, right? They don't want services. But did you offer them a house? Was that part of those services? Did you say we can, li we can literally end your homelessness? That is such a strong and pervasive tool in the life of somebody who is homeless. The homeless. That woman I talked about yesterday who I went to see, when I told her, I was like, yeah, I work for Pathways of Hope. She's like, yeah, I don't know you. And I think she was you know, having something going on with her. I bought her a cookie, and I was just like talking to her. <laughs> and she goes, so I told her what I do, and she goes, oh, you're actually trying to help people like me. And I think that is so telling about the experience our current population of homeless have with so many people that they come into contact with that they're trying to get a service from. It's that incentive that will move people in the right direction to keep them from doing things that are wrong. And it's not gonna be perfect. We will still have people that break the law. Probably not too many. I mean, Larry's touting 95, 96% of his people have no interactions with law enforcement and do not have to leave the property within a year. But the idea that we wouldn't have recourse, no, we will. We absolutely will. And we'll work with you on that, too. So, I, that's the best I can do right now, to be honest, because there's still so far to go in this process that um, it's not fully fleshed out yet, but it will be, and we'll make you a part of that process. And does that go for visitors, too? I mean so we have a question tonight about visitors, so can we wait till we get to that? Sure. Cool, thank you. Was that, all, uh, was that one, you got one more to do? Yeah, okay. You mentioned uh, residents potentially being kicked out. If they're kicked out, where are they going? Don't they go into our neighborhood? So are you sending them somewhere, or what are you doing if you kick them out? We're going to get in sync one of these days. Um, it's a super good question and one we're totally cognizant of and we knew would come up. So it's really fairly simple. Um, we have had this experience already. So Pathways does a small number of permanent supportive housing scattered site units, which I mentioned earlier are sometimes harder to manage because you're not there all the time with the people. And so they live with a landlord in an apartment situation that's somewhere else in the community. And sometimes you have people who have some significant issues, right? 
Um, so we had one that it didn't go well. It went totally south. I'm just gonna be honest. It's not perfect all the time. She broke the windows of her apartment and she, got, she had a mental health episode. She stopped taking her meds. And we think a lot of it was that she needed to have a centralized location where the case managers basically lived next to her to help her. Um, or this was not the right housing intervention for her. But what we actually did is we did some horse trading, to be totally honest. We called another agency who was having problems with somebody else and needed a different intervention, and we swapped. And we said to the person, hey, this is a more appropriate housing placement for you. And then they had someone who was more high functioning, you could say, I guess, or was not less likely to have that kind of issue. I think they had substance abuse in their past and were, were kind of like Miranda, had, had a long-term sobriety. So we kind of did a horse trade, to be quite frank. And that took care of the problem. So anyone, and again, if you're thinking about 60 units and a 94 to 95% average retention rate, maybe one person a year is gonna have a problem that you're gonna have to do something. And our first inclination, our first instinct is we would call Larry, we would call Friendship Shelter, we would call another agency and say, hey, do you have a space for this person? Because here with us, it's maybe not the best opportunity. And to your point, and sorry, I don't know your name, the woman who asked the first question. Hey, Marie. Hi, I'm David. Um, <laughs> We, um, we would be early and often in that intervention and talking to people saying, maybe this isn't the right place for you based on these things that are happening or these patterns we're seeing and we need to find you a different place. But with a 95% retention, which is about average for supportive housing in, in this time period, in the 90s it was like an 85%, but we've kind of fine-tuned our technique, um, we would call somebody else and find a more appropriate placing, placement for them. So the, the goal would be absolutely unequivocally never to be get out of your apartment and go back to Adelina Park. That's not a good solution for anybody and not what we're trying to accomplish. So. Move on to the next question and you can ask. Will Keystone bring down property values in the area? Who will stop the residents from trashing the neighborhood and the park? So we, we literally cut and pasted some of these questions and we think they're good ones. So um, we want to address both these points. I'm going to ask Judson from Santa Ana Housing Authority to talk about the first part about property values, if he doesn't mind. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to, uh, to speak with you tonight. Um, my name is Judson Brown. I serve as the housing manager for the city of Santa Ana. Uh, in many respects, considered ground zero for homelessness uh, in Orange County. Um, so when we... A couple of years back, when we decided to uh, um, launch our first investment into developing permanent supportive housing, um, this was also a concern that, uh, that uh, was raised at the time. And um, the fact that we faced, and we know we, we continue to face, is that uh, homeless individuals roaming around on our streets, in our downtown, uh, uh, sleeping outside our businesses, those negatively affect our economic development activities. Those ne negatively affect our city more than if we place those individuals into housing units using supportive housing. So uh, um, uh, the uh, investments that we made in permanent supportive housing in our city uh, um, with one of our uh, newest projects called The Orchard, uh, um, that project has reduced the prevalence of individuals roaming throughout our community affecting our property values, affecting our businesses. And uh, um, in, in terms of this project bringing down, uh, bringing down your property values, um, what, we can, uh, uh, what we can attest to is that um, the developer of this project, CNC Development, uh, in partnership with Pathways, their projects are, are in many cases superior to the uh, various multifamily rental projects that you drive by on a daily basis that are deteriorating, that are not being well taken care of. The CNC is such a care and, 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 and uh, effective management of their properties that in many cases you drive by their properties and you will not, reckon, you will not even be able to recognize it as an affordable housing project. That's the kind of project that the city of Fullerton will get and that's the kind of projects that in the city of Santa Ana already has. Um, so we're, we're, uh, we're very, very supportive of this project and we, uh, we're very excited that the, uh, uh, of the, the partnership between CNC and Pathways of Hope. 
so speaking to it as a developer of affordable housing, there, there's there's a number of studies that have been done, and, and, and we can we can talk about over the years about the relation between property values, affordable housing, as neighbors, not negatively affecting the value of, of, of existing properties. Uh, probably the better point to make: we can't afford as a developer of affordable housing as Pathway of Hope, being a member of the community, a partner with the city, and just an industry in general to build a development, build projects that are not going to be examples for other cities, other parts of our community that we operate in. We need to be the example from not only, shared a little bit with the architecture, the style of the building, Judson saying, you know, coming by the property, not even knowing it would be a permanent supportive housing project, thinking, and we've had comments before in the past where we've had meetings with neighbors and then said, well, we're not sure about having affordable housing in the neighborhood. We're not sure of this particular use. And we said, well, you know, we have a property in your neighborhood already, you know, right down the street. It was actually one of the examples that I had shared on, on, on the screen previously where they thought they were for sale condominium communities, where we are examples that you would be proud to take other cities to, other community members to, and, and show not only the architectural the style of the building, but the operations of, of the property as well. And that's why it's so unique in this circumstance too. Also be looking at the opportunity to provide office space for Pathways of Hope to be here on a continuous basis, every day of the week, not only do you have folks that are operating and, and are at the property after hours, but you have David and his team during every working hour of every week or every work day that you have out there. I'm just going to add like a feminine voice because I know Larry and David have been talking a lot. Um, <laughs> So um, I get their numbers and statistics. We partner with statewide partners to actually do um, real estate development studies that show, like Judson said, that these are oftentimes the nicest facilities in neighborhoods. Um, but I'm sure you all are tired of hearing about statistics and data and they all kind of blend together after a while. So I will just share with you um, that I lived in Fullerton for five years and um, I moved to Irvine after that. Um, and everyone thinks of Irvine as the bougie place where all the nice rich people go to live. I am not bougie, a little bit, but I, nor rich. Um, I live less than a half mile away from a permanent supportive housing site in Irvine. Not only permanent supportive housing, um, but mental health vets. So people that are funded through Mental Health Service Act dollars. I run by it two to three times a week um, on my morning runs, and I didn't know that it existed until somebody asked me to do a site visit. Um, it is nestled in between million dollar homes um, in Irvine. These facilities are beautiful. And if the city of Fullerton chooses to move forward with pathways of hope in developing this project, what I would tell you, you should demand from your city council like the city of Irvine demanded from their developers and from their service providers, is that this will be an asset to the community and the way that it looks. And there's a lot of control over that process. But when I take elected officials on housing tours, there are some of you in this room that I met up with on a Friday and took you on a mini version of that as well. Um, I play a game with them as we drive down another site in Irvine that has permanent supportive housing. And it's also near market rate housing, market rate apartments. And the game that I play with my elected officials is tell me which one is the permanent supportive housing site. 60% of the bus gets it wrong and it's because the other 40% flipped a coin and happened to guess right. <laughs> I, I can only tell you, you know, from data and, and things of that nature, but I can also tell you from my own personal experience living next to one of these facilities, that they are an asset to your community in a multitude of ways, including the aesthetic characteristic of it as well. I have a question. Uh, why West Fullerton? We We've had everything dumped on us. The armory, other housing, the eight, this lucky motel down here that just bought. 
Why do we have to have it all? East Fullerton can have some of it. I know you have a mandate, and this is a great thing for that, but why do we have to have it all on West Fullerton? I've lived here for 47 years in this house, right across the way, and I don't think it's fair that we have all this right here in West Fullerton. I ha I've raised my kids here, I have my grandkids here, and I don't want them around this. I have six grandsons. I'll be perfectly honest with you, I don't think it's fair. So that's on the agenda for next week, so I hope you show up. Um, but what I will say, I'll, I'll answer it really quickly because I'm not afraid of the question. Um, I agree with you. I do. I 100% agree with you. Again, I'll say it again. Show me the site East, East Fullerton. Kimberly Carter. City of Fullerton does not own that property. No, you can buy it. Oh, you will? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you are who I've been looking for my whole career. Sure. Yeah. say, I understand and validate that. I live in a very high traffic, homeless place myself. Um, if you've spent any time in Old Town Orange, you know, I, yesterday, or two weeks ago, I walked out on my porch and saw a guy across the street from me with his pants around his ankles, screaming at a dad, walking his baby in a cart, trying to start a fight with him. So I live it too, a lot of us do, and I get it. The one thing I, I would just, I would just go back to what I was saying earlier. Number one, this, this thing we're building is not, the armory, and it's not something that has people shooting up outside, and it's not these things you're talking about. This thing takes care of what you're talking about, and so I mean that's just that just is what it is. <laughs> well, we're trying to, and, and I, but I get your other point too, and I, maybe I'll maybe I'll cover it right now. I don't know <laughs> that you've had enough of things that deal with homelessness being put on this side of town, right? That is your point. And, and look, it is a completely valid and understandable criticism of what has happened. And I can't tell you how much I think about that because I do, I truly do. There's two things to think about. Number one, we went to the city and offered a solution. We said, this is a good solution, we think, supportive housing, which look, many of your community members, especially after last week's meeting, came to me and said, hey, we get it now, like supportive housing. Like, we get it, we just don't want it here. Okay, I can, I can, we can have that conversation and I get it. We're looking to provide a solution to the issue of homelessness, which affects every single person in this room. And frankly, regardless of which city you live at this point in Orange County. When we went to the city, we said, where? They gave us some locations and only one of them was tenable for what we wanted to do at this time. Now, that's not to say the future, it couldn't change, there couldn't be other opportunities. As I said, our job is to activate on opportunities to end homelessness. But I do wanna be very, very clear. What we are proposing is not the armory. What we are proposing is not a shelter. What we are proposing literally ends homelessness in the experience of tripping. I mean, it does. It does. And, As, as Bex so well said last week, much better than I ever possibly could, yes, we need more permanent supportive housing to help these people. We do. different area than what the orchard is in. So it's hard to compare. 
Um, the other thing was um, the place in Irvine is for families. It's not single adults. Do you want to talk about it or not? Is it primarily families? Yes. Or is it primarily sorry. single adults? Sir. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. We have to do the mic thing. Yeah. I can just scream at you, but I have not <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay. And um, so the, the site that we were talking about, we're speaking in code, it's called the Doria. Um, it's located in um, the city of Irvine, in East Irvine, um, where I live. Um, yes, and the Doria does serve primarily families that are of extremely low, very low, low income, but it also has a specific number of beds, which is either 11 or 14. So I'm sorry that I can't remember which one of those numbers it is, but it's either 11 or 14 that are specifically set aside for Mental Health Service Act dollars, so folks that have extreme mental health service needs within Doria. And to my knowledge, um, I will have David correct me and send out and post to all of you if I'm wrong, the folks that are served inside those specific units are single family. Sorry, singles. I realized that was confusing. Single family, I mean individuals. How many families? Are you talking about with the MHSA dollars or just on the site? How many families in Adoria? I don't know how many off the top of my head. I don't know for sure. So if I can, if I can, there's a couple people I want to jump in here because this is an important point. What um, Kelsey was describing, MHSA funded clients or, or residents or what have you actually have the highest level of need and almost need constant care in some cases. So that apartment community on paper, right, with, with maybe not having the experience of living next to one or managing one or whatever should be the most problematic. Um, it, it's that funding is specifically tied to high, high, high acuity clients, like people that can barely put pants on and have a litany of mental health issues that need, like I said, almost constant care. Um, and Doria has a pretty impeccable track record, but the, the needs are so acute that they actually won't let you, they won't, even though that money's out there and you can do it, they won't let you put very many people in one place. Um, because of the high level of need and the impact on neighborhoods. Um, that's the severity of the people that she's talking about, Doria. Now, I get it, it's not that many people, so, we, but. Sorry, I just had to no. talk because I was on that tour. Yeah. And when I spoke with Helen, she said that you guys are seeking, um, I guess, like 40, to put about half of people with like mental health oh. problems in there. She said you're, you're seeking, that's what she said. Okay. Kelsey, you were there. I can clarify the question. What Helen was referring to is the funding source that's attached. That's that's the Mental Health Service Act dollars. I'm sorry, I'm speaking in acronyms, guys. I promise I'm not trying to. There are new regulations that are attached to a funding source that can also fund mental health beds. It's called No Place Like Home, and that has a rule in place that says if I have 100 units of permanent supportive housing no more than 49% of those units can be funded by No Place Like Home Dollars. Judson, did I say it correctly this time? Okay, okay. That is what Helen was referring to. Helen, we all love her, has no idea what yeah. you are planning to do. We haven't about any of this. Yeah. It's totally honest. Yeah. I mean, this, Helen's awesome, known her my whole career, or this second career for me. She, her and I have never had a conversation about Keystone other than, hey, can you come to the community? So she was probably talking about, and that's the number I was referring to earlier, the max amount of super difficult to use people, the mix is 49%. That's the most they'll let you do. We have no intention of doing that. Well, how many, because she was very sure. clear and said, no, this is what pathways no. we're planning on doing. So just to be very clear, we're definitely, we don't know the overlay of dollars yet. We do not expect to go that route. If we do, we will make it clear and transparent to everyone and talk to you about the population mix you can expect, because there's, there's also a, a potential we could do some veterans work and we would communicate that to all of you. Um, at this time, we have no intention of going into that. If that changes, we will let you know. I will tell you this, the only way we could do it is if it was an extremely small, manageable number. Also, we just got a text message from somebody who works at Danbury and works with that population exclusively. There's 20 units of it at Doria, which is actually kind of a lot of people that have severe and persistent mental illness. So there's like 100 and something people that live there. 
So proportionally, it doesn't seem like a lot, but 20 people who are having that kind of consistent set of issues and episodes, that's like 20 people who are all having basically a shared mental health episode all the time. That's a lot of people, regardless. I mean, 20 is a lot, right? Do we agree? <laughs> Yeah. Like, there's a family five say that lives in, in an apartment, sure. and she said like the grandma has a mental health issue with her son, the daughter, and their kids all live there. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not like there's 20 people like you know. And, and Dory was huge. Dory had like a swimming pool, sure. granite countertops, stainless steel appliances. It's a nice place. Yeah, it was. It was. I'm a member of the community who came to learn about this. Project. Sure. And it's obvious that there's a lot of people who are, I believe, monopolizing the conversation. I would like us to stick to our program, finish the questions. It's obvious that this panel has had a lot of interaction sure. with certain members of the public. You're not going to resolve your differences here tonight, but you are gobbling up huge amounts of time that I would like to learn about the project. <laughs> And really quick, Stephanie, Nina, you two of all people know I am always available. I will always meet anyone and talk to them. And I know some people don't want to meet me one-on-one -on -one or whatever that is, but that's fine. But I am so happy to meet with anybody so we can continue the conversation. But we do need to move on because it already is 7.20, and I'm already going to say we're going to go to 7.45, which we have the room rental for a shorter period of time. Though. But all we're trying to do is catch sure. up Absolutely. between other places. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Just sure. Just Absolutely. 100%. All right, Jason. <laughs> Will Keystone residents be allowed to bring their homeless friends to stay with them in their unit? Absolutely not. Simple as that. So there'll, of course, be a guest stayover policy. Could you imagine telling Miranda her parents couldn't come hang out with her? Wouldn't really work. Can a person just have people stay with them? No, of course not. Will we be in their units on a frequent basis, checking in with them, making sure things are going okay, and then watching and monitoring areas of traffic coming in and out of the apartments? Absolutely. Will we have rules where there could be possible um, recourse to, to remove someone? Again, incentivization? Absolutely. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Larry because he has some experience with this piece. No? No, you answered it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. okay. Then let's move on. Fall. Yeah. Do you have a... No, that was my fault, not his fault. But do you have a follow-up question around that? Hi. Um, will there be like, um, I guess, a security guard? At, is it like, is it gated? I don't know if it's gated or not. Um, and if so, would like visitors be able to like check in or you know have to show ID to come in and stuff like that? Yes. Yes. So um, the filtering in for a walk-in person will basically go by our office, and there'll be a mandated area to check in and things like that. So that will all. Yeah. No. No. It's fine. And there'll be security cameras and everything else. And yes. Another question around that question. Yep. What will the property look like? Will there be fences and gates? Are we okay with that? Keep going. Right. Keep going. There it is. Your question is the PSH model. Can you explain what supportive services are and tell us more about the services that will be offered at Keystone? What will you do to help people with mental health issues, physical disabilities, and addictions? Okay. So um, support services, essentially whatever issues led to someone becoming homeless, um, we want to be able to address. So if it's physical disabilities, if it's mental health, if it's substance abuse, like we talked about the first question, if it's economics, so it's job related, if it's training related, we want to offer every single service you can imagine and we would be able to do that. These programs offer you that kind of flexibility. There's funding available. Pathways of Hope already works with partners in every single one of those fields. Um, I mean, whatever service it takes to get someone stable and moving forward with their life, we can pretty much make available. Um, one of the things we're kicking around is that we have a really good relationship with both Cal State Fullerton and Fullerton College. Um, we are looking at possibly, Miranda actually did mention it in her video, she went back to school, which is awesome. I mean, even if it's just like one class at a time or something, it's amazing. 
Um, we want to be able to do a lot to facilitate those kinds of activities for people. So, you know, everything from mental health stabilization all the way through to, hey, what's the next step in your life? Like, what can we like help buoy you into? Um, is what we want to have available. Um, and what will we do to help people with mental health issues, physical disabilities, and addictions? So we work very closely with the Orange County um, Healthcare Agency. Um, we're extremely good friends with ours. They work at our shelter now. Um, believe it or not, you know, our shelter has these issues now, and it's a housing first model, and we do a really effective job managing them with all of our partners. Um, that's probably why we have so few calls to the police. Um, but pretty much every service under the sun, one of the big ones, and I know people want to talk about buzzwords and things like, you know, quote, self-sufficiency, which is really hard for someone with severe physical disabilities in particular. Um, there's a new partner coming to town. Um, they do job employment services very specifically with the homeless. We've already brought them in, um, and they'll be a part of any package we put together to help serve these people in the most appropriate way. Um, just real quick on the services. Please beware of saying, oh gosh, we heard uh, a group in Los Angeles does, you know, here's the 17 laundry list things that they do. That's not how you want to drive services. What's going to happen in a facility like this is you're going to engage with your client, the residents, and the residents are going to tell you what's needed. And every community is different. Uh, the whole point of it, though, is housing stability. But, you know, it, it's really tempting for those who are on the outside to say, oh gosh, I know for a fact they need these eight things. They may or they may not. A lot of it is having a healthy engagement with the resident themselves, and, and, and they will tell you what they need, and then you deliver upon that. And that's, I am sure, what will happen here. Yeah, I was wondering, yeah, it's on the topic that you will, because it was my question. Um, it, what, that we be giving them transportation, because there's gonna be definitely, you can't have everything on site, like if they need, if they need, and my other question is, will you have crisis, uh, you know, you said you're gonna have social workers like their case managers, but will they have crisis intervention right there on site? So if they do miss a, they do miss a dose of their medications, they, they are having a, not a crisis, but getting there, like that they can reach out to someone on site, and then if needed, you could take them, you could take them somewhere else if they needed something you couldn't provide. Okay, so yes, um, so the, I'll, I'll deal with the crisis intervention one first. Um, Nishta is our director of programs. She won't mind me calling her out because she's the toughest woman I've ever met in my life. Hi, Nishta. Um, she's in the back there. She's our director of programs. She puts all of our staff through trainings for crisis intervention, trauma-informed care, and everything else. Every level of program staff gets all of those things, and um, staff we hire for this will be more specific in that, so they'll be more skilled and more able to do it. Um, and your first question about transportation, one of the things about Commonwealth is it, it's a good bus route, and so is Brookhurst and so is Euclid. So um, getting to services that might be in another part of the county, um, we are going to provide bus passes and things like that. There's other transportation options. Some nonprofits are getting creative using things like Uber and Lyft and stuff like that. But um, transportation will definitely be, and we know kind of how isolated this site would be in terms of um, there's not a grocery store close by and things like that. So there's a lot of work we're doing already to think about how we can bring some of those services in through delivery systems and stuff like that. So, is that good? Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I sit on the Community Development Block Grant Committee for the city, and I've heard a lot from the recent applicants about youth that are coming out of foster care, and they age out of the system, and then there's no money to help them from, from the county social services. So I was thinking maybe this could be a place where we could put some opportunity for transitional housing for young people and being as close to the colleges. It'd be a great start to your new life as a newly emancipated young person. So I thought maybe that's another population of people, just youth coming out of foster care that don't necessarily have any health issues, but just need a place to get on their feet and get some experience and education under their belt so they can make their way in the world. So, so we know uh, maybe the fastest growing population right now of homeless is youth. Uh, across the country, and so there's a huge emphasis uh, from HUD uh, to focus on that population. 
Um, they would have to be chronically homeless to qualify for permanent supportive housing, so they would need to have some kind of physical or mental health disability or substance abuse disability and have been homeless for a certain period of time. Um, the county, as far as funding this project, has asked us, like, would you work with this population? The, they call TAY, transitional age youth, so it's, it's basically quote unquote kids because we're all adults at 18, but they're, they call them transitional age youth, 18 to 24. A lot of them are emancipated foster youth and do not have the services and face massive challenges. We'd be interested in working with that population if they qualified, if they were tied to Fullerton, and if they needed this kind of intervention. And, and but I mean, that's who this is designed for, is, is people who qualify in that way, so. What kinds of amenities will be available to the key to Keystone residents, and will there be communal areas? Um, to answer this question directly, so the, gone over when we looked at the site plan for the project, one of the things that's extremely important to us, and I, I think that this site plan and the site in particular being triangular lends itself to is having enough open space where you know we're, we're, we're providing for opportunities for folks to be outside folks to be outside on the property you know a, a half acre of open space for any community a community you know three times the size of this it, it is a large amount of open space uh, the the building will also be developed it has an, an independent from pathway of hope's office uh, space will be about a 2,000 square foot community space which will will house um, um, uh, meeting rooms, community center room, have exercise equipment, typically we'll put um, indoor exercise equipment, although um, recently we've been starting to do outdoor exercise equipment as well, uh, just given our um, climate that we have, actually something we saw in the city of Santa Ana, which was, was well received. Um, but, but to provide those opportunities for folks to, to not only engage with each other, to host other people coming into the community room where we have space for folks to meet, for folks to congregate, and for, for, for us to organize events with our residents. Um, you know, we're not providing a house, we're providing a home for, for folks that live here, so we want to have those opportunities for people to interact on a daily basis in, in a variety of ways. Is it around? Yeah. The as far as amenities go, like inside, are these fully furnished? Are they going to have pots and pans and kind of everything they need to kind of start their new life in this? Place like, I mean, obviously they're not going to have money to purchase beds, couches, TVs, you know, potentially food, maybe. I mean, what types of things are they going to be are going to be provided to them in their parking lot? Really good question. Like they pretty much have all been. So yes. So uh, apartments would come somewhat furnished. So things like refrigerators are part of the budgeting that you do for this kind of project. Um, there's even food stipends for folks, so we can provide food, we can provide pots and pans. We do that now for our permanent supportive housing. We have a budget we can draw on so that someone like Miranda or anybody else who comes in and literally has nothing. Um, not only that, but our plan with our community room in particular is to do a lot of life skills education, especially when people first lease up the apartments. Larry, how long did it take to lease up the orchard? Not very long. Not very long. So it happens quickly, and what you really want to do is try to get people used to having their own place somewhat. So you do a lot of life skills classes teaching about how to organize things and how to cook and what safety is and all of those kinds of, of things. So it's not just providing them those things, but it's making sure that they can use them in an effective way and that they, um, they, they, they have what they need so that it's not just... A, because the worst thing that can happen, I think, in this kind of situation is someone gets one of these apartments and it's not their home. It's just four walls. And they're like, what do I do with this? Um, and really the best thing that happens with housing and health is again reintegration into what I call normalcy, right? So I can go and make, well, I was about to use macaroni and cheese and I'm a vegan, so that doesn't really work. Um, but I can make a simple meal in my house, a peanut butter sandwich, and like we want people to be able to do those things too and feel like it's normal because that is what it means to integrate back into society with the rest of us when you've been homeless. Like, like, wash, like a washer and dryer? Oh yeah. I think, we'll, I think the site design have a laundry room yeah, if you have a laundry room. So we'd work with them on how that works and, you know, go over that. I mean, I lived at apartments all growing up as a kid, and they're all a little bit different, so you would just kind of have to work through those nuances. One more about the question. No, no. <laughs> Hi again. Um, so I, I like this, you know, the communal areas. So would there be programs in where 
uh, we'd be able to, you know, either hold like the drives for like food and clothes and stuff like that, especially like to help the integration process and also look to give them our moral support. So, you know, because that's also an integral part of, um, you know, for them to stand on their own and whatnot. I don't know you, but I like you. I like your stuff. <laughs> Because, yeah, that stuff's important, right? I mean, Pathways has thousands and thousands of volunteer hours dedicated to it. Some of you are here tonight and volunteer for us, I think. And thank you. Thank you. Um, and we would absolutely want to do that. Um, so before I started this job, I, I ran um, a, what we call a residential ecosystem in domestic violence. And domestic violence, victims of domestic violence are homeless by default. It's a definitional thing. So um, we used churches and faith-based groups and so many awesome community groups, Rotary, NCL, I mean, you name it, to come in and provide all kinds of stuff. Mentoring, I've already had people reach out to me and say, hey, when Keystone's ready, which will be like in three years, um, you know, I wanna do mentoring, I wanna write resumes for people, like I wanna help with this stuff. Like people just kind of start coming up and going, hey, how can we help you help them to stabilize, integrate, and do those things? So yeah, absolutely, there'll be tons of opportunities for that stuff. Why do you call it permanent supportive housing when it isn't really permanent, is it? Well, we talked about the question. Well, we talked about it. Well, I know. I know. I, the, the question is such, it's almost impossible to answer because it is permanent. I, I, don't, I can't understand the, the premise of the question. Um, permanent housing has to do with the length of stay there. And is there an artificial sort of time constraint? There is not. There may be people who move on. Yep. A very, very small, small minority, um, um, you know, might move up and out. Um, again, as we talked about, this is a population that is, that is, generally speaking, severely disabled. So to assume that a lot of folks are going to move out and beyond probably isn't good policy because you're directing ideas and resources to a small minority population. But no, this is in fact permanent housing. We've seen instances where people move on to conventional Section 8 vouchers because they just do so well that they can then go and get a regular apartment on their own, still with a subsidy because of their disability. We see that, but I mean, Larry's points are well taken. Any questions around that? What will you do to help people who are capable of working secure employment or pursue educational opportunities? Uh, I think I covered this, right, when I was talking about partnerships with Chrysalis and Fullerton College and things like that. So unless there's a follow-up question, I think we can probably move on. Okay. Oh. Why do these homeless people get to live in free housing while I have to work hard every day to pay for housing on my own? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, for those that were here uh, last week when I shared about the UCI cost study, we're actually, and for those that weren't, I'll kind of revisit those figures. So, what we're talking about is permanent supportive housing, and that's a very specific solution for people who are chronically homeless, as has been mentioned already. So, they have a disability, and they've been homeless for a significant period of time. And we are actually spending a lot of money on these people. Um, to leave them on the streets. So the average cost is $100,759 per person per year. So that is our money, your tax dollars, um, our costs and police calls and fire departments going out, sending out rigs, people visiting the ER, they tend to stay longer in the hospital because there isn't anywhere for them to be discharged to, to recover. So we are all incurring a lot of costs whether we like it or not. And as I shared last week, it's actually 50% cheaper to place people who are chronically homeless into permanent supportive housing than it is to leave them on the streets. So there are cost savings as well as it being a more dignified approach to homelessness. And with regards to it being kind of free housing, I do just want to kind of remind us all that the people that go into permanent supportive housing do have a chronic disability. 
okay? So this is not something that you can just walk up or sign up for. You have to have that diagnosed disability and you have to have been homeless for 12 months or longer. So this is not something that anybody would qualify it for. It's a very specific group of vulnerable people that would meet that criteria. So um, so in regards to how our system works to get into permanent supportive housing, you have to go through coordinated entry, which has been talked about before. And then specific projects can put specific criteria on that. So for example, the Orchard Project in Santa Ana was targeted specifically, and I know Justin can speak to this more, was targeted to people who had been camping in front of the Civic Center in Santa Ana. So they had to have been homeless for 12 months or longer, did he die, did qualify as chronic homeless when they went into coordinated entry system? That was long before the orchard was ever kind of dreamt of in concept. So people don't move somewhere to get access to permanent supportive housing. People will rotate to access an emergency shelter. People will rotate to access a soup kitchen, but it's not the same draw with permanent supportive housing. It's very, very different. Hi everyone, good evening, Jose Castaneda. Uh, my question is regarding veterans. So there are a couple of veterans with uh, mental disability, or with just disabilities, and um, uh, I know that there is a federal voucher program. Uh, are they able to apply or qualify for this when there's also a voucher program, and would that voucher program be applied to some of the units? Yeah, absolutely. The, the short answer is yes. I mean, the, the, the more sort of, I don't want to be elongated about it, but the truth is like we can talk to the county and say, hey, we want part of our, our set aside for vouchers to be veterans. And then we could go to the VA and say, how many veterans are you seeing in Fullerton right now? Give us that number. And if that number's five, we say, okay, we'll set aside five of these units for your five chronically homeless veterans. And then the VA comes and provides a whole bunch of services that are very specific to veterans. We're extremely sensitive to that. The question we have, and we don't know, and we won't know we don't know now what will happen in three years is what's the veteran population look like that's chronically homeless. That's the only question we'll have to answer. If it exists and it's substantial, we'll take them. I mean, absolutely. And we'll do it with the VA so the VA can support it. And we're already running along, but Judson could go on forever about VA programs and how successful they are, but, but I've gone on forever, so I'm gonna stop. Can you show us the proposed number of permanent supportive housing units each OC is taking on per the plan? explained by the ACCOC at the last meeting. I am the God. I am the ACCOC. Not really, but um, these numbers haunt me every single day now. It's great. Um, so for those of you that maybe weren't at the last meeting, I do very quick bridge. Um, my organization is the one that came up with the need gap with permanent supportive housing. How many permanent supportive housing units do we need in the County of Orange to create flow in our system so people are not stuck in shelters or non-permanent housing? Um, the answer we came up was really weird number. I rounded it up to 2,700 to make my life easier. Um, not one city in the County of Orange raised their hand and said, I want to take 2,700 units of permanent supportive housing. Wasn't very surprised by that either. Um, so I began thinking, and I want to emphasize this a little bit because I have a very strong affinity and I probably will get in trouble for saying this for those of you that ask the question of why West Fullerton. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in studying when it comes to permanent supportive housing and homelessness services is where we place them. And one of the ways that I wanted to try to address that through our work was by saying, it's not gonna just be Fullerton, it's not gonna just be Santa Ana, it's not gonna just be Costa Mesa, Anaheim, Orange, all of the people that have taken the brunt of this for years. That is not fair and it's not right because this is an issue that affects the entire county. So I took 2,700 
And I divided it by 34 cities. Um, and the way we did that was to take the individual population of each city, their resident population, and divided that by the 2,700 units. So if you have 3% of the population, you took 3% of the units. So that helps places like Santa Ana, Anaheim, Fuller Chang, Costa Mesa, and Orange that have an over-concentration because you all have just taken the brunt of the issue and helps alleviate that problem. So you're not having to build 500, 1,000 units within your communities. It then gets me in trouble in other places that don't want to have um, permanent supportive housing in their communities. But I think that we have to address this as a county and that's the only way to create um, a lasting solution is to make sure everybody is doing what we refer to as our fair share. So the actual question says, can I share the numbers? And the answer is absolutely. If you go on to our website, I'm 98% sure our data sheet is on there. I have emailed them out everywhere. They've been basically tattooed on me for the last nine months. I don't have them in front of me, um, but I will, as soon as this meeting is over, email them to David. He will post them online. But what I can share with you is how many of you have heard of SPAS, service planning areas, a couple of you? We basically divided the county into three different areas, a north, a central, and a southern spa. So one of the other things that I did with the individual city counts and numbers is I divided them up by spa. And I said, how many is north county responsible for central county and south county? And I can share those numbers with you because I was able to find them on my phone while we were sitting here. Um, so south county is responsible for 696 of the permit supportive housing units of those 2,700 units. Central County, which includes places like Costa Mesa and New York Beach, is responsible for 990 of those units. And North County, which includes Anaheim, Fullerton, is responsible for 907 of those units. If you were a math major in college, you will notice that those numbers do not add up to 2,700. Um, and that is because we also allocated 107 units to the unincorporated parts of Orange County to also say that the county was responsible for helping bring some of these units online. Um, you will notice that those numbers differ, um, but each part of the county has a share of them. And what I can tell you just personally um, is I will be at any community meeting that's about permanent supportive housing in any city in Orange County, whether I'm invited to sit up here like David or if I'm not invited. Um, because I think that this is a solvable issue, but it is only solvable if every city raises their hand and says that they are going to do something. And I think that we can truly get there if every city does something. Any questions? All the time, so I'm sorry. ACCOC stands for the Association of California Cities, so that's the ACC part, Orange County. And you can find us online at accoc.org or our Facebook page. Yeah, this is really where my, I, I'm Rachel, I'm a resident across the way, and I'm actually, I have a pretty ob objective approach to this whole thing. That my issue sits right here, and I don't know who the people are to address this, but I was really offended by being called part of the urban core of Orange County. I grew up here, and I didn't know we had an urban core, but guess what, we're in it. And I would just, my question is whether we're, it's actually three, one is probably for you, but I think that the issue is so complicated, and I, I even feel a vibe in the room of like us and them. Some people are for this, and some are against this, but it's actually a really complicated, you know, multifaceted issue. And we ought to be really nice to each other as we try to figure this out. My question for maybe for you is: uh, I asked you last week, is there a wiggle room here? Is there a way to split this up, not by population, so that the cities that are already so saturated are not getting? I, it makes me sad that Santa Ana has. 350 more beds they have to do, and then Anaheim has 200, 300 more beds. And then, uh, sorry, while I have the mic, I would like to know if if you would be willing to share the um, the questions for next week before we come, so that if as a community we think maybe 
those aren't exactly the questions. I feel like the first four slides were all about what happens when people leave sure. the Keystone and go across the street. And second thing is, I'm just curious if y'all would be willing to be on a panel to answer questions where the community asks the questions and maybe invite city council, a police officer, maybe someone from the county. Um, I hate to put you on the spot, but I think it's the only place where I can get a lot of people. Social media is not the place to do much, is it? chemistry than David and you. Um, so, a uh, long question, somewhat short answer. Can you guys hear me if I just talk to you like this? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just sorry. Stand up, though. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Yeah, there's wiggle room. So, um, ACCRC, nonprofit, 501c3, I'm not the government. I can't come in and tell cities to do anything. I don't have control over people's arena numbers. I don't have control over people's land use authority. All I can say is that permanent supportive housing helps us save money as cities, and our cities desperately need to save money, which is why we originally stepped into this. So yes, I can give an allocation to a city and say, here's what I think is, quote, the fair share. I've got a lot of feedback from individual cities that, no, that's not my fair share, here's my actual fair share number. Here's the, the secret. I, I don't care if individual cities build exactly 182 units or build 57 units. I would be thrilled if they build 25 or 60. Because here's the secret. I'm gonna have some cities that look at these numbers and say, I don't wanna build it, I don't wanna do it, it's not my problem. And that's really unfortunate because I do think it is an entire county problem. But here's the other secret. I am gonna have cities that step up and say, we are willing to do this. We are willing to do more than our quote fair share. I cannot share with you the individual city because it was a closed session conversation, but I have a city in the northern spa, not the city of Fullerton, so you all don't get upset, um, that was given a very small allocation. I want to say something like 26, 22 units. And I went and met with them, and they said, we sat down with our police chief, and he is telling us that the best way that we can improve the quality of life in a certain part of our neighborhood that has motels, that have a transient population, is to do permit supportive housing. So I know our number was only 26, but do you think you could find funding for us if we did 87? So I am not worried about each city meeting their specific individual number. What I am most worried about is each city thinking about how they contribute to this problem and how they can be part of the solution. And also, Santa is going to be fine. They're going to hit their number in like the next 12 months. So you guys are good. With, with respect to format, which was your other question about how we do this, I think one of the things that's important is like we get these are your questions, and we wanted to give good answers because just talking back and forth, we'll get what we had earlier, which was someone saying, "Wait, why don't we move on to another topic that we all care about?" So we're trying to find the best format that works, and this won't be the last series of meetings, not by a long shot. So this is going to be a long process of dialogue. I'm happy to have it. So. And the last question. What was that? Was the last question? What was your second one? Would y'all be willing to answer questions where the format is run by an outside group? I mean, I feel like I kind of, I kind of just answered that. Like, we have a long ways to go, and we'll kind of figure out what the oh, future looks like. Oh, I thought you were answering, like. answering the other one. No, okay, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. So we are out of time. We have two more questions. Um, do you guys want to hang out and do the last two? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll do them. Okay. So this kind of, Kelsey kind of already addressed this. We just need the county in general to get committed and serious about building permanent supportive housing to take on our problem. We know our problem is at least 2,700 people. It's probably a little bit bigger. Um, this is a solvable problem. LA County has 58,000 homeless people. LA County is only three times the size of Orange County, population-wise. It's 10.17 million versus 3.17 million. LA County has 58,000 homeless people. We have 2,700, maybe a little bit more. This is a solvable problem. So the question of, do we have to build more PSH, where does it end? It ends when chronic homelessness ends, quite frankly. And it ends when that burden is shared across the community and across the entire county, not just the city of Fullerton, and definitively, certainly not just West Fullerton. Uh, with respect to the first question, um, so permanent supportive housing sites are not magnets. There's not, because of the qualifications and what you have to do to get into them, they are not magnets. Uh, magnets are things like walk-up shelters and soup kitchens 
and things like that to a certain degree. So I just want to address that. And if there's a follow-up question specifically to that, or we can go to the very last question so everyone can get home in time for Matlock. Just kidding, Matlock's not on anymore. Is there, yes? Okay, uh, I don't think I need to like Okay, you're good. Uh, We serve approximately 60 homeless people a week, okay? Give it to lunch. Sure. I would say that probably five of those <coughs> would qualify under your guidelines for this supportive housing. They're mentally ill or they have a, an addiction or something. There's a whole group of people out there that are unemployed, or if they are employed, they don't make enough to get into an apartment. Yes, and there's also de de definitely 60 people we can take into the project that are spread out. So for the other 55 people in your instance in particular, mm -hmm. that is definitely a population. We all need to work towards housing, and the way it happens is people like Todd and CNC get projects to do affordable housing because the cost of living in Orange County being what it is, and it's only going to get worse in the future with our economic climate. And, and that is, I will tell you, I, I said I said earlier, God, I hate this. I said earlier, the property, things like that don't keep me up at night. What keeps me up at night is five, ten years from now, our population has doubled yeah. in homelessness. That is what keeps me up at night. And that is that population you're talking about. Yeah. And so, yes, we're with you on that. Do the last question. Okay, if Pathways has no experience running a large PSH program, why should we trust you to run a PSH project like Keystone successfully? I would not have put this up, except it is one of the things I heard the most from day one. I am not qualified to answer it. Well, yes, I am, but I'm not going to, because I think that would be kind of strange. Um, my friend Larry wanted to answer this, because he has experience with growing an agency and doing certain things. Uh, thank you, Tim. So the first and direct blunt answer is they do, and they will. Um, uh, uh, Pathways has a long-standing history of excellent services, of, of being well-run and being a, a, a positive contributing community member to the city of Fullerton. As was said earlier, they are already doing this. They actually have experience doing this, working with this population. Uh, they are in collaboration with several other nonprofits. And again, just to repeat, our retention rate is over 90% for the hardest cases that are out there in the streets. So this is something, maybe David is being very modest, that he and his team are already doing. They are already at all the conferences, they are at all the trainings, they are leaders in the community in terms of elevating the, the, the level of service and the types of people, the, the most vulnerable people that we should be serving. They're doing so much more than maybe a lot of us in this room um, um, are, know about. But the big thing too that's also worth knowing is they are not doing this alone. When Keystone gets built, they will be part of a collaborative, Mercy House is a part of it, and several other nonprofits as well, where on a regular basis we all do what's called case conferencing. So it's not just the pathway staff, it is the collective wisdom of all of us that are in this collaborative where we're going back and forth, what are the best practices, how can we support each other. They're actually tapping into, uh, into this network, so they will be surrounded by support by people who do this all the time. Again, just to repeat, I know there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of nervousness. Our agency, we again, we place about 1,500 people a year in the housing. We could probably count on two hands the number of households that are really, really super problematic. That's it. The numbers are, are smaller than you guys might think. Mm -hmm. Pathways is an incredible organization. They're doing it, and they're doing it in partnership with other great partners as well. This will not be a problem. I, I just want to add uh, to um, the developer CNC is one of the absolute top affordable housing developers in Orange County. Uh, uh, this partnership between Pathways and CNC development is 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 a fruitful one, and and the city of something that the city of Fullerton and residents of the city of Fullerton could be proud of. Uh, uh, we uh, our city has uh, um, roughly. 900 units that have been developed by um, by CNC in our community. All of them are successful. Many of them are managed better than our uh, our private market uh, units. 
and uh, um, and this is the kind of leadership. This is the kind of this is the kind of partnership that uh, our that the city of Fullerton needs. And really, I, I wanted to share earlier to address uh, some of the, 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 the concerns about uh, the inequity of this issue and the burdens that we face. Uh, Santa Ana is your your sister city in terms of in terms of. Uh, facing the brunt of this issue. We, 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 the host of the other armory, right? And uh, what we've been doing for years of, of just hosting the armories and, and allowing unsheltered uh, individuals to, to roam our streets has not been working for us. It has not been working for us at all. Permanent supportive housing as a solution is working in the city of Santa Ana, will work in the city of Fullerton, and the partnership between uh, Pathways and CNC is, is one that's something we can all be proud of. So in my role at the association, I work with um, lots of developers and lots of service providers. I have been walked in a room with Larry for eight hours multiple times talking about this issue. It's an enjoyable experience. Um, Pathways of Hope has a 95% retention rate. They have helped end homelessness for over 250 people in just last year alone. I would not come and put my name and face, because I've been Facebook Live by half of you in the room, and say that I believe that Pathways of Hope and the association believes that Pathways of Hope can be successful and that the city of Fullerton believes that Pathways of Hope can be successful in delivering a excellent product, an excellent service model for the city of Fullerton, if I did not truly believe that they can do it. I have been in charge of our homelessness task force that has over 100 people show up once a quarter and sit in the Care Ambulance Center in Orange and talk about how we try to fix this on a regional basis. And Pathways of Hope always sends like four people and they always have the best ideas. They are one of the most engaged community members. Um, in, in this topic. And so in terms of the people that you would want to help you do this, Pathways of Hope is it. Not only because they're good at what they do, but because they're here in this room with you right now trying to talk through and answer the questions that you have and work through these problems with you. I know lots of people that won't do that. They are part of your community. They have been a part of your community for a multitude of years. And I would rather know the person that's gonna help us solve this issue than have somebody else come in that I don't know. And I know David, and I know his team, and I have full faith that they will deliver um, something that this city can be very, very proud of. Uh, I'm really bad at talking about myself. I was more uncomfortable for the first like few minutes talking about what we do and stuff than I am now talking about the issue because of just the passion I have for this. Um, all I'll say is um, this is what I do. This is what we do. And all we're trying to say collectively as a group, as Pathways of Hope, as our stakeholders, our board members who are in the room, our volunteers, our staff, we just want the opportunity to help end homelessness in a city some of us grew up in, some of us grew up around, and that we work in and operate and serve every day. That's all we're asking for is the opportunity. I want to thank you all for coming out. I'm sorry we ran long. This was a great conversation. The questions, I just, just briefly, I just tallied it up. And in essentially two hours, we answered 34 questions with all the follow-ups and the original questions, um, which is a pretty good ratio, a couple minutes of questions, four minutes of questions. So thank you all very much. Look forward to seeing you on the 27th. Thank you for your time. And my contact information, please call me. Here's the site if you want to come take a look at it. Thanks for everything.